This morning, I, uh, I titled my message this morning, When the Lord is Near, There Is No Fear, right? Yeah. And uh, sometimes whenever I'm in the clinic, I tell these kids I'm about to, I'm about to make a rhyme for them. But uh, I didn't do that on purpose, but it just seemed like that was kind of where my message was. When the Lord is near, there is no fear. We're going to be reading out of um, John chapter 9, and we're going to probably start at verse 23. But before we start reading, I just wanted to kind of give you a little bit more of the background from verses 1 through 22. And this is the story where God heals the blind man. It's a blind a man that's been blind since his birth, right? And God uh, heals him. Jesus heals him. And the way that he does it, if you'll remember, is he, he makes clay. He takes the dirt from the earth and he takes some spit, some of his spittle, and he, and, he, and he sits there and he kneads that clay in his hand. And then he rubs that clay on the man's eyes. And he tells him to go wash himself in a in the pool of Siloam, which is translated as Sint. That's the S-E-N-T. That's the name of the pool, the pool called Sint. And so the man goes and he washes his eyes and he comes back and he can see. Well, there's a lot of different things that take place within the midst of the story. Like, for instance, you may not realize this. I've shared this with the church before. If you've been coming for a while, you might have heard me say it. By the time Jesus showed up on the scene... The Pharisees, which were the religious leaders, in case you don't know that, some people don't know some things. I like to write on the board. This is a good excuse. There were two groups of religious leaders. There was one called the Pharisees, and there was one called the Sadducees. And so it's kind of like, uh, you know, America, we have a Congress, and we have a, we have a Senate, and we have a House, right? Well... Israel was a, was a country that was based on a theocracy. It was built upon God. And so the leadership of the nation were religious leaders, but they also made the rules and they determined how people were to live based upon the law. We learned this at the first church I went to. The kids learned the, a song and they said, I, I don't want to be a Sadducee because Sadducees are Sadducee. And the reason that they were sad was because they didn't believe in the resurrection. They were the ones that talked to Jesus and called him into question. We won't get into that. But anyway, there were these two religious sects that ruled the country. And they, did, they interpreted the law in matters to try to explain to the people what was right, what was wrong. And that's how the, that's how the law was, the people were governed. Um, in this story, though, so they had created like um, really 600 of their own laws that they had added to the law of Moses. Because whenever you live according to law or rules or regulations, everybody, and this is the heart of man. Listen, when the true gospel doesn't reach into your heart, the true gospel, when it reaches into your heart, you know what it does? It kills the old man and it gives resurrection life to a new man. Does that make sense what I'm trying to tell you? We'll get into it a little bit more before it's over with. So, 600 laws that they had added, because the point that I'm trying to make with all that is, is that when you leave man to himself, and this happens, I'm telling you, if you've been saved for any length of time, I mean, what, do we, what do I mean by saved? Let's just slow it down a little bit. Before you were born from your mother physically, you were born of Adam. That's what the Bible teaches. It teaches that you were born of sin. It teaches you had a physical birth. But Jesus said man must be born again. And whenever Nicodemus heard that from Jesus, he didn't know what he was talking about. Nicodemus was one of these religious leaders. He said, how can a man climb a second time into his mother's womb? Jesus said, no, what's born of the flesh is flesh. What's born of the spirit is spirit. There's a physical birth. Then there's a spiritual birth. Amen? Amen. When you're born again spiritually, something happens. The Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of your heart and he begins to rearrange things. Yeah. He begins to change things. Amen. Yeah. And so, but what I need you to know is, is that even once you get saved, many times you become, before you realize it, self-righteous in your own heart. Self-righteous in your own mind. Now, the next thing you know, you start looking at everybody else and you realize, huh, I don't do the sin them people do. And you start thinking that you are better than somebody else because you don't have their particular sin problem. I didn't realize it, but that's how my little sister, I always tell this story, thought about me when I wrote her a letter after I got saved. And I'm like, and by the way, fornicators will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Wrote that letter and sent it in the mail. She's like, well, then you in trouble, bro. You the worst one I ever knew. And, you know, what mama said was, you know, I'm glad you found what you were looking for, son, but you're freaking me and your sister out. That's actually, I didn't plan on saying that, but that has a little bit of something to do with my message this morning. 
we're concerned sometimes about how people are going to perceive us, right? But nevertheless, like these religious leaders, these Pharisees, if the true gospel doesn't reach in and begin to change your heart and reveal to you that you were not okay, you might not have been as bad as the preacher. But guess what? You were born of Adam. You were born in sin. You were not okay. You were not all right in the eyes of God. You needed Jesus to pay the penalty for your sin. He was the prescription that the Father wrote. Yeah. Amen? Amen? And so these Pharisees, they were angry because Jesus, the way Jesus healed this man. Because one of the laws that they had added in that 600 extra laws was, Thou shalt not need clay on the Sabbath. Need. K-N-E-A-D. Needing. It's kind of like taking something and doing this number here with it. All right, where you're mixing it together. Well, so Jesus took some dirt, he spit it in, and he kneaded the clay. <laughs> they didn't like that. But you know what's interesting is, is that Jesus broke that law on purpose. Jesus broke that law on purpose to show them what true righteousness was. Because yes. that was a law that they had created, and Jesus is coming to give people true righteousness. Yes. He's coming to give people true life, and the religious people in the world are going to be against true conversion and against the true gospel. And also, not just the religious people, but the world itself doesn't want to see you truly con converted. They want to see you the old way you were. They want to kick it with you the way you used to be. They don't want you to be different because when you're different and you begin to speak about the things of God and how God has changed your life, it's going to make them uncomfortable. All right. And so that's where we are, that this man now, he's not blind anymore. Hallelujah. He can see. Praise God. I mean, listen, when a miracle hits your heart and changes your life, it's very difficult to shut somebody like that up. Amen. And God now, the Lord has touched this man and now he can see. And so where we're going to start reading in, in, in John chapter uh, 9, verse 23, is that the, the Pharisees or these religious leaders are wanting to get to the bottom of this. They're wanting to know what's going on here. And they're questioning his, his parents. Now, one of the things that the religious leader said was, if anybody's going to call this man Messiah, which I've explained this before, but for in case we have some people in here that maybe haven't been studying the Bible for a long time because it's something new for you. Messiah means anointed one. <clears throat> God, throughout thousands of years of human history, through the nation of Israel, promised his people Israel through his prophets that the anointed one was coming. I'm telling you, I could sit here and I could list off all kinds of scriptures where God told us that he was coming. In the garden, he told us that he would be the seed of the woman. Later, he told us he'd be the seed of Abraham. Later, he told us he'd come from the tribe of Judah. Later, he told us he'd come from the seed of David. And the, the, the psalmist said that he, 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 in a prophetic psalm, he said, they have pierced my hands and my feet. So, well, a thousand years before Jesus ever walked on the face of the earth, the psalmist David said, they have pierced my hands and my feet. They have cast lots for my garment, meaning they rolled dice at the foot of the cross to take my clothes. And that's exactly what they ended up doing in Matthew chapter 27. Yeah. Sat there and cast lots for Jesus' clothing. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that God for thousands of years has been communicating this message to humanity saying, I am real, I have a plan, and I'm sending the anointed one. And when I send him, he's going to bring salvation to those that are lost, those that are blind and cannot see. He's going to bring sight to them. Hallelujah. And that's exactly what Jesus has come to do, to bring sight to to those that cannot see. And so here we, they, but they said, the Pharisees said, if anybody believes and calls him Messiah, then they're going to be cast out of the synagogue. What is the synagogue? Well, it's kind of like in this time frame of Jewish history, they had churches kind of like what we have. And they, it's where they would go in and they would teach the law of Moses. Before they just had one big temple. It's a long story on how we got to synagogues. We're not going to get into it. But they would have synagogues all over the place. Like we have churches in a lot of places. And what the religious leader said, if you're going to, anybody's going to call him Messiah, they're going to be cast out of the synagogue. And so here we are in John chapter 9, verse 23. Um, well, actually, let's look at, go just back up one verse to 22, if you don't mind for me. It says, these words spoke his parents because they feared the Jews. That's another way of saying the leadership of Israel. 
For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, did I say Messiah? I said Messiah over here, but the, the, the Messiah, Messiah is the Hebrew word, Christ is the Greek word, okay? So Messiah means anointed one, Christ is the Greek word means anointed one. So that's what these Pharisees were saying. If anybody calls him Christ, the anointed one, he will be put out of the synagogue. Verse 23. Therefore said his parents, he is of age, ask him. Then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. That's another way of them saying, for, him, for them to say, give God the praise. That was another way for them to say, you need to change your testimony. You need to change your testimony from saying that he brought healing to you or that he is Messiah, that he is the Christ. We know this man is a sinner. You need to give God the glory. All right. He answered and said, whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know that whereas I was blind, now I see. Then said they to him again, what did he to thee? How opened he your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you did not hear. Wherefore would you hear it again? In other words, why do you want to hear it again? Will you also be his disciples? Then they reviled him and said, you are his disciples. You are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from where he is. From whence he is. It means where, his, where he comes from. What source he's from. It's not so much talking about we don't know where he was born in Galilee. We don't know what source he's coming from. Does he come from God or does he come from the evil one? That's basically what they're saying. The man answered and said unto them, why herein is a marvelous thing. Now you got to get, you got to try to vision yourself, visualize this situation. We have this man, I meant to tell you too previously, because of his blindness, he was reduced to begging. Yeah. So you got this man, and you can only imagine what he looks like, because he's been a beggar on the side of the street, and he's been blind since the day of his birth. He doesn't even probably, he doesn't really know what his clothes look like. He doesn't have a lot of money. His clothes are probably tattered and torn. He's probably disheveled and a mess looking. And here he is right here, and he's having a conversation with the leadership of the country. Now, you got to see, if you've ever seen a movie of ancient Israel during the time frame of Jesus, these people were all dressed up in all kind of pomp and circumstance. I mean, you'd think some of these preachers nowadays with the suits that they wear or something else, you ought to see the way these people dressed. I mean, I'm talking long flowing robes, these big old turbans with jewels. I mean, it, it was just a sight to see the way that they, they were all pompous and so proud of the way that they looked. And here's this man, and he's like, well, this is a marvelous thing. He's over here having this conversation. He's standing up to him. You don't know where he comes from. But yet, I used to be blind, and now I see. Right? So he's standing up to them is basically what's happening. It says in verse 29, We know that God spoke unto, this mo this, uh, unto Moses. I'm sorry. Let's go to verse 31. Now we know that God hears not sinners. This is the man still talking. Now we know that God hears not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God and does his will, him he hears. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? You've never seen this before, that some man opened the eyes of someone who was blind. If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. They answered and said unto him, you were altogether born in sins. And dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talks with thee. So previously, you got to understand, this man had never seen Jesus. Jesus put the clay on his eyes and told him to go to the pool to wash his eyes. And now he's able to actually see what he looks like. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. And Jesus said, for judgment, I am coming to this world that they which see not might see and they which see might be made blind. Now, I got to tell you that if you ever have a conversation with someone who wants to argue the Bible with you, they could try to use this. 
and say that the Bible contradicts itself. Because in the beginning of John, it says that God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. Jesus just said right here, for judgment I came into the world. So in other words, it's like, well, did he come to judge or did he come to save? His point to this is this. People, this is why I came into the world. Because there's people that are blind. And there's people that are blind that are going to hear my voice. And when they hear my voice and they receive, they're going to be able to see. But then there's people that are going to hear my voice, but they're going to reject the voice. And because of that, they're going to remain blind. And it's going to ultimately lead to judgment in their lives. It's a scary thing. It's a fearful thing for people to expose themselves to the gospel of Jesus Christ and at the same time reject it and pretend as though it were not the truth of God because now you will be held accountable for the amount of light that you were exposed to. Right, right. Amen. And he goes on to say in verse 40, And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remains. In other words, what he was saying is, at least if you were going to sit here and say that you were blind, you could at least try to have the defense. It's not like it, it's not going to end up letting you get set free. But you would at least have the defense to, to claim you were ignorant of the truth. But because you say you do see... Your, your sin remains and you remain bound up in your sin. In other words, they're saying we see the truth, but Jesus is really the truth and they refuse to see that he's the truth. And because of that, their sin remains. And the same holds true for people today. It's different in believing intelligently or intellectually that Jesus is real and something altogether different to believe from the heart that Jesus is real. It's when you believe with the heart and surrender the life that you're truly born again. Amen? And so uh, I, wanted, I just wanted to point that out. All right. So now we're going to go ahead and just start in the message. I said, when the Lord is near, there is no fear. So this story that we read this morning, it contains within it a lot of spiritual truths too. So we're seeing the story of a physically blind man who now receives his sight. And I believe that there's certainly some spiritual application to that also. That so many of us, well all of us, born of Adam, are, are born blind to the spiritual truths that are related to God. He had been reduced to begging. Because of his blindness, he had been reduced to begging. He, did not, he didn't know the pathway, really the right way to travel. Because he didn't know where he was going physically, he couldn't see where he was going. I suppose he could have had a stick, but he never really knew clearly where it was that he was supposed to go. Spiritually, for me, that speaks a lot. I got to tell you that for a long time in my life, when I was blind to the things of God and I was operating in my own wisdom or the wisdom I was trying to receive from people around me, I was blind. I was stumbling around in the dark, could not find the right pathway. But thank God that whenever I gave my heart to Jesus, from that moment moving forward, my spiritual eyes were opened. And from that day moving forward, I began to be able to see a little bit more clearly each and every day. There's a lot of spiritual truth, like I said, that relates to our conversion. If the truth be told, we have to be careful that we don't become like the Pharisees. The Pharisees felt like they could already see. The Apostle Paul said in Ephesians 1.18, if you'll put that verse up, <clears throat> the Apostle Paul prayed for the church of Ephesus. This was one of the churches that he preached to and he wrote this letter to. This is what he said. He said, the eyes of your understanding. He said, this is what I'm praying for you. The eyes of your understanding that they would be enlightened. Now, I don't know if you've ever, this is how I think, you know, back whenever David and I were in nursing school, we used to, they talked to us about critical thinking. Like, in other words, don't just read what you see something on the surface. You got to start thinking about it. You got to start working with this stuff a little bit. So when I see this, the first thing that hit me when I first read this was, well, I didn't even know that my understanding had eyes. What the Apostle Paul's trying to say is, he's talking about your inner man. He's talking about the person now that's saved and born again. The inner man, the understanding, the connection that you would have to God, that those eyes would be enlightened. In other words, that you would be able to see spiritually. 
That you begin to see spiritual truth. That you'd be able to have understanding about the things of God. That you would be able to know what is the hope of His calling. What is the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. God wants us to know the truths and the riches about what awaits us. And the connection that we have to the Lord. And be able to see past really this physical world that we're constantly running around trying to find pleasure in. That God wants you to know that there's a bigger picture out there. Amen. Amen. So we don't want to be blind like the Pharisees. We want to be able to see. This blind man used to be blind, but now he's able to see. Amen. Just as in the story, false religion and the Pharisees and the persecution of the world want to try to prevent us from being able to move forward and really being able to see. And the first point that I wanted to make to you is I wanted to make you aware that the enemy operates through fear. Now, many of you already knew that, but I'm just here to remind you. The enemy of your soul operates through fear. Let's go back to John 9, 23 and 24. It says, Therefore said his parents, He is of age, ask him. Now, you may not see it right there, but what's going on here is that his parents are stricken with fear. His parents don't want to get involved in this situation. If you go back and you read, it's like, we know he's our son. We know he used to be blind and that now he sees, but he's of age. Why don't you ask him the rest of the story? Because they knew that whoever called Jesus Messiah was going to be kicked out of the synagogue. They're now stricken with fear. Their hearts are stricken with fear. They don't see the miracle didn't happen to them. They weren't the ones that were blind and now can see. You can sit here all of your life and you can try to tell somebody else the good news of the gospel, but until it happens to them, until it really happens to their own heart, even like you know, I, I mean, I can't tell you how much time I've spent really talking to my children about the Lord. And even not just my children, but other people. That, that doesn't mean I did everything right, because I know that I didn't. But at the same time, I know I spend a lot of time talking to my kids about the Lord. But until they come to the place in their life where either, number one, they're, true, they're converted. But then, number two, where they have to trust God for themselves in the midst of their own situation, in the midst of their own circumstance. Then guess what? They're not going to really know for themselves until they have to face it just like their daddy had to face it. I had given my heart to the Lord because I was a mess and I knew that Jesus was the answer and I gave, I bowed my knee to the Lord, but it wasn't until tragedy struck my life that my, that I really felt like I became like this blind man and I was able to see. It was like all of a sudden when tragedy struck my life and I came to a place of brokenness and I truly surrendered to God, then my eyes were opened and I was able to see. And as painful as it was to experience what I had experienced before, hallelujah, it brought me into a new walk, a new place, a new understanding about the things of God. But his parents, they hadn't experienced that. That's the only point I was trying to make with that illustration. You got to experience for your own self. You got to experience God for your own self. That's right. Amen. And they knew that something miraculous had happened to their son. But once again, the miracle had not happened to them. We know he's our son. We know he was blind. We know that he now sees. But you need to ask him <laughs> about the rest of it. See, I want you to know that this is one of the greatest tactics of the enemy. In preventing people from really giving their hearts completely to God. And you know what I'm talking about? The fear of what other people are going to think. The fear of what other people are going to think or what man is going to do to us. Now, you tell that to the wrong person. And immediately they shut down. Because there's some people that don't fear anything physically. You understand what I'm getting at? They're like, dude, fear? I ain't scared of nothing. And I, and I get that. I mean, there's been a couple things I've been scared of in my life. But I, I don't think that I've been scared physically of a whole lot of things. And so in the past, had you told me I was fearful about something, then I probably would have lashed back and said, man, what are you talking about fear? I'm not scared of nothing. But the reality is, is this. Is that you might not have called it fear, but I didn't want people to think bad things about me. I can remember times, and I know I've told this story before, but one of my friend, some of my friends came and picked me up at my sister Debbie's house. I'd given my heart to the Lord, and I tried to make a clean break from all them people in Lafayette. Dude, I gave my heart to Jesus, bro. I'm different now. I ain't going back. 
Well, they come passing through on their way to home, and they're like, hey, fat boy, we're going to home, you know, blah, blah, blah. And the next thing you know, I end up with them, and we're doing all the same stuff that we used to do. And part of the reason was, was because I didn't want them to look down on me. I didn't want, I wanted to still, it, it, there was a connection between those people that I used to run with, and now it was so different than them. I didn't want them to see me as weak. I didn't want them to see me as different. And I can remember sitting there in that living room, watching TV with them after we had partied all night long, and I'd done all this stuff that I used to do, and the Holy Spirit was convicting my heart. The Holy Spirit was telling me, you're different. And I was so uncomfortable. And I can remember telling them, I'm like, dude, y'all got to take me home, because I ain't the same. And I'm not staying here. Look, don't, don't hand me that stuff. I ain't putting it to my mouth. I need to go. And while we were in the car, I can remember him saying, man, y'all remember that dude, Matt, bro? It was so cool, man. Remember when we used to part? And they were sitting there acting like I wasn't in the car. But you know, one of the things that I realized is, is that we do have a concern about how people are going to view us. We are concerned about how our family looks at us. We are concerned about how our old friends look at us. And whether we want to admit it or not, many times we are stricken by fear and concern that if we tell people that we've given our heart over to the Lord, and we tell people that we believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, oh, it's okay to say, oh, I'm a Christian. Now, that's a cool thing now to tell everybody you're a Christian. But guess what? Ain't nobody changing, letting God change their life. Nobody's doing anything different than what they ever used to do before. They just blend in right with the world just like they always did before. There's no true separation. They still do all the old stuff that they used to do. There's no persecution because they still live in their life the way they always live their life. Yeah. But there's a separation with true Christianity. Yeah. God draws a line in the sand. He says, you're either going to serve the world or you're going to serve me. And listen, the enemy wants to use the tactic of fear to try to prevent us from allowing ourselves to give ourselves completely over to God. The flesh, what does that mean? Self. The old man wants to hold on to itself. It doesn't want to die. The, the, the Apostle Paul spoke about this in Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 18. He says, therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh. A debtor means you owe somebody something. The Apostle Paul says, you don't owe your flesh anything. You don't owe your flesh a thing. What you owe somebody something is you owe something to the Lord. He purchased you. He bought you. He gave you new life. He says, he says we are not debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. In other words, to continue to live for what Matt wants. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. What does that mean? What does mortify mean? Well, a mortician is somebody that embalms dead bodies. It's talking about death. Mortified. It means that the Holy Spirit will allow death to take place to the parts of the old man that want to stay alive. Whatever the old man used to do. Sometimes I talk about things like sin, like partying, but sometimes it's not even just the party stuff. Sometimes it has to do with the way that you respond to people. The way, and I'm, I'm preaching to myself. The way that you always have to be right. I'm definitely preaching to myself. Oh, always got to be right. Always going to be an argument. Oh, no, you didn't research that like I did. I'm going to have to show you that I know what you don't know. No. Put to death. Let the Holy Spirit teach you humility. Amen. You don't always have to be right, Matt. Amen. You don't always have to win the argument, right? And, and, and that's just a new way of living, a new way of lifestyle. He says, you shall live for as many as are led by the Spirit of God. They are the sons of God. Look at this. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. We're talking about fear right now. The enemy's tactic is fear. The enemy wants to cause us to fear that we're going to lose family, we're going to lose friends. The enemy wants us to fear persecution from the world and from religion. The enemy wants to cause, because of fear, to keep our mouths shut. And what the Apostle Paul goes on to say is this. But you have not received the spirit of fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. God now is your Father. Who do you have to fear, is what he's trying to say. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. 
And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so, be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. What did he, to wrap it all up, I know that was a lot. Basically what he was saying is, you're going to suffer some things on this earth. You're going to suffer some persecution. Because that's really what he's talking about. If we went back and read the whole context, he's talking about persecution. He's talking about sufferings. There's going to be people that are going to come against you. There's going to be people that are going to be haters. There's going to be people that are going to clown you. Okay, and it's going to happen. There's going to be people that are going to talk behind your back. If you put yourself out there and dare mention the name of Jesus in public, I can assure you there will be people that will clown you behind your back. The question is, did you take a look or read the book to see what they did to the Lord? Right. Do you see the way they treated him? They spit on him. They thrust a crown of thorns on his head. They blindfolded him. They slapped him. They hit him in the head with rods. And they said, prophesy, son of man, who it is that strikes you. In other words, they were messing with him. Oh, you're such a prophet. Tell us now that you're blindfolded who hit you. They put a purple robe on him and a crown of thorns and said, oh, look at the king of the Jews. If they, Jesus said, if the world hated me first, then you should expect that they're going to hate you too. When you truly take a stand for the Lord and you allow God to change you, I'm telling you right now, it's going to cause a separation between you and the previous life that you knew and the people that you knew are going to come against what it is that God's doing in your life. Amen. But I just want you to know, with all that said, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. That's, that's point number two. The enemy works through fear, but God hasn't given you a spirit of fear. Religion is trying to do the same thing to him that it did to his parents, right? It came against, okay, tell us, tell us about your boy. Don't ask us. He's of age. They're stricken with fear. They don't want to deal with it. But look what happens when they start talking to him. Hold up, restore. See, the miracle hit him. The miracle hit him. God hasn't given you a spirit of fear. He gave you the spirit of adoption. And now you can cry, Abba, Father. Now the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. And that what you feared yesterday, you don't have to fear today. Religion is trying to do the same thing to him. They want him to change his testimony and say that Jesus didn't give him sight. And that Jesus is a sinner. But he experienced the miracle. He experienced the miracle. The hand of God touched his life. He was blind and now he sees. Yesterday he didn't know what path he was walking. Yesterday he was a blind beggar on the side of the road and couldn't even get a job. Today he can see. He can go get a job now probably, right? He can see something. He knows how he can count money. I'm not saying he couldn't count before. I've seen blind, well, look, blind people count money. I don't know if you've ever seen that, noticed that or not, but they got blind people that, that own these little things in the hospitals anyway they can count money so that wasn't a good illustration <laughs> whatever the case he he wasn't able to he was a blind beggar now the lord's delivered him and he can now get a job he can take care of himself the hand of god touched his life amen same is true for a person who was once spiritually blind but now has been saved and can see you know you can in, in second timothy chapter one verses six through nine we're talking about the spirit of fear again. The Apostle Paul was talking to young Timothy. He said, Wherefore I put in thee remembrance that you stir up the gift of God which was in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner. See, the Apostle Paul was in prison when he wrote this letter. And you can only about imagine what people were saying about Paul. Oh, you, you, you following that guy? Look at him. He's in prison. He can't even take care of himself. But that be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. The, the context here really is that the Apostle Paul is telling you on Timothy not to be fearful of older ministers that are going to call into question his youth. He's saying, remember the gift that was given to you. Stand up. You don't have to be fearful. God hasn't given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. Stand up and do what it is that God has called you to do. The context still holds true for you and I, though. 
God has given us the gift of the Holy Spirit. God has given us the Holy Spirit. And he's saying, don't shrink back. Don't be timid. Don't be full of cowardice and fear. That's really what the word means right there. That word fear means timidity or cowardice. And just as Timothy was to remember the gift of God in him, the Apostle Paul also wants you and I to know that we've been given the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I want to talk a little bit more about that. Acts chapter 1, verses 7 through 8. You know, when you get saved, I don't teach a lot on this. I don't teach enough on this, but I'm going to teach it to you right now. When you get saved, the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of your heart. If you've been saved, you know what I'm talking about. The Bible also teaches something, a second work of grace that happens after salvation is called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Baptism into Christ is when the Holy Spirit places the believer into the body of Christ. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is when Jesus baptizes the believer with Holy Ghost and fire. The Bible teaches in the book of Acts, and I'm not getting into it too deeply, but I want to mention it to you. That in the book of Acts, Jesus said that they were to wait for him in Jerusalem. After he died on the cross, after he resurrected and he walked on the face of the earth for 40 days, before he ascended to the Father, he told his disciples, go and wait for me in Jerusalem and you're going to receive the gift from my Father. And he said, when you receive the gift, because what they were asking him is this before he ascended, when are you coming back to rule on the earth? When are you going to be the king that we've all been wanting to serve? He said, for you it is not to know the times or the seasons. He says, which the Father has put in his own power, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. We believe we are, we, you know, we were having a conversation the other day about well, why do we call ourselves non-denominational? Aren't we Pentecostal? We are Pentecostal. We don't believe that women can't cut their hair, though. We don't believe that they can't wear makeup. Jesus, the Lord said in the Old Testament, he said, man looks at the, at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. God's looking to change the, the inside of a person. You can't make yourself holy by wearing a dress from here down to your ankles. That doesn't make you holy. I've seen women that wear dresses like that. They, you can see through them because it's a, got a sheer fabric and you basically they just be walking around naked if the sun hits it right. But that ain't holy. That ain't righteous, right? You understand what I'm saying? God doesn't work on the inside of people's hearts. What I'm trying to talk to you right here about, though, is this, is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Bible teaches, and we believe in Pentecost, that whenever the, the disciples were in the upper room, that on that day when the Holy Spirit descended upon them like cloven tongues of fire rested upon their head, that they began to speak with other tongues. The difference between when you first get saved is that the Holy Spirit comes to live in you. When you get baptized with the Holy Spirit, there's an overflowing of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The initial evidence we believe, at least in the Pentecostal doctrine, is that the initial evidence that you've received it is that you will speak in other tongues. Now, whenever that young lady was here that preached for me, I heard when I was out of town in Mexico, she gave a word in tongues. She spoke in tongues, but then she gave an interpretation. That's different. That's the gift of tongues. We speak, the Apostle Paul talked about that in the book of Corinthians. The gift of tongues is different than when you first get baptized with the Holy Spirit and you speak with other tongues. The speaking with other tongues was just an evidence that you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Once you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, some people operate in that gift where they speak out loud in tongues, then they give an interpretation and it becomes a word for the church. It's like a word of prophecy for the church that God speaks through the people. But the point that I'm trying to make to you is this. The whole purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is that you would receive power from on high so that you would be witnesses for God. That's what Jesus said. Tarry for me in Jerusalem. You will receive power from on high and you will become witnesses for me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the outermost parts of the earth. When you go back and you look at the disciples before the day of Pentecost, Peter's running 
back to go back to fishing. They're, they're separating themselves from the Lord. Whenever he was arrested, they all scatter in different directions. But after they get received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Peter stands up and says, These men aren't drunk as you perceive, but this is that which was promised by the prophet Joel, and that this is the Holy Spirit moving, and 3,000 people were saved that day and added to the church. What I'm here to tell you this morning is this is that the Bible teaches that there's a baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Bible teaches there's a second work of grace. People get so caught up in speaking in tongues, though, and I'm here to tell you that it's not all about the speaking in tongues. It's about the power part, to receive power from God so that you could be a witness to do the work of the kingdom. And that's, uh, I just see a type in this blind man who was touched by God, and now the Holy Spirit has moved on the inside of him even before people are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Some people teach. You shouldn't even be in ministry unless you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. I don't believe that. I've seen Baptist preachers who told me they weren't baptized in the Holy Spirit. They tell them more people about Jesus than I ever did. What I'm trying to say, though, is this. When the Holy Spirit shows up on the scene, something changes. And something has changed in this blind man. He used, to, he used to be blind, but now he can see, and now he's over here standing up with boldness, unlike his parents, and he's telling these religious leaders, he's standing up to them, and he said, hey, this is a marvelous thing. You don't know where, he's, where his source comes from. You don't know whether you're calling him a sinner. You think he might come from the devil, but no man has ever laid hands on a blind man and made him see. But I'm here to tell you, I used to be blind, but now I see. The main thing I want, hallelujah, the main thing I wanted to encourage you with is this. You should seek after everything that God has for you. You should cry out to the Lord and say, Lord, if this baptism of the Holy Spirit is real, fill me up. You should get yourself alone in your house. You should put on worship music. You should seek the Lord and you should say, Lord, fill me up with your presence. Fill me up with your spirit. Give me all that you have for me. Seek after the things of God. Don't seek after the things of the world. Now I gotta tell you that sometimes some of this stuff gets kind of weird. Some people are a little bit weird with some of this stuff. <laughs> I don't want to be weird. I just want to be on fire for Jesus. Amen. Amen. But I'm here to tell you that it's real. And I'm here to tell you that when the whole real Holy Spirit shows up, it isn't weird because it brings glory to God. It magnifies Jesus. It doesn't magnify self. It doesn't magnify the preacher. It magnifies the Lord. Amen? Amen. It says right here in, in John chapter 9, verses 25 through 27. He answered and said, whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know... Whereas I was blind, now I see. Then they said to him again, What did he do to thee? How opened he your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you did not hear. Wherefore, would you hear it again? Will you also be his disciples? The main point, once again, that I wanted to make is that when a person is truly converted, the world and religion might try to get us to change our mind. But when a blind man can now see... He doesn't want to go back to the way that he used to be. I, 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 while that song was playing, that last song y'all did, I looked at my notes because I knew I had something in there like that. And it wasn't exactly like the song said because the song says, I don't want to go back to my old life. Amen. And what I had in my notes was he doesn't want to go back to the old way that he was before. When a man that was blind can now see, he doesn't want to go back to the way that he used to be. Number three. I want to talk to you a little bit about the voice of God. If you go to John chapter 1 and you read verses 1 through 8. See, whenever Jesus starts teaching in John chapter 10. I said 1. I'm sorry. I meant John chapter 10. When Jesus is teaching in John 10, he's teaching based on the background of what we just learned about. This blind man. Does that make sense? <laughs> and so there's no break in the text. He's just continuing on. This situation has happened. This is the gospel of John is full of this. Jesus performs a miracle and then based on the miracle, he starts to teach. And so when he teaches in this, we're just going to read verses one through eight. He says, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that enters not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Just keep going through because we're going to read all the way to verse eight. But he that enters in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter opens, and the sheep hear his voice, 
and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. And when he puts forth his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spoke Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spoke unto them. He's using an illustration that was common during this time frame of Israel. At nighttime, there would possibly be multiple shepherds with multiple flocks. And there would be a place that was prepared to handle all these flocks for the night. So all of these shepherds would bring their flocks into this enclosure. There would be a door that would be closed. There would be a porter or a gatekeeper that would protect the sheep for the night. The next morning when the different shepherds would show up, I don't know how they did it, but they would have different things. Just like a cowboy calls his cows, a shepherd would call his sheep, right? They'd, shh, 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 I can't whistle too good, but whatever they did, they'd whistle and they'd, they'd start calling their sheep by name. Hey, Rover, hey, Prancer, hey, Dancer, whatever their names were. And the sheep knew the voice of their shepherd and they would literally start to separate themselves from the rest of the flock, and the rest of the sheep that were in there, and they would just follow him out. The porter was the gatekeeper, and Jesus was making a, a distinction between himself and the false teachers of the Pharisees. Because he said, somebody that climbs in another way is a thief and a robber. The porter sees the shepherd, and he opens the door. Jesus had a right to come to this earth because this earth belonged to him. And all those sheep inside that enclosure represent the souls of the world. And some people are going to be willing to hear the voice of the Lord and respond and follow him. And there will be others that are unwilling to hear the voice of the Lord. And they will not respond, and they will not follow him. But what you got to understand, though, is this, is that there's also teachers that are coming in another way. They're not going through the door. They're not speaking the truth. Jesus came speaking the truth of the Father. And those that hear his voice, they don't listen to the voice of a stranger. But there is a stranger's voice. There's a stranger's voice that's coming in another way. The enemy works through false. He works through deception. He works through false prophets. He works through a lying voice. And that's one of the things that you need to see. See, that's what the man said. He said, he answered them, I have told you already and you did not hear. I'm trying to tell you what happened. This man named Jesus touched my eyes and now I see. And there's so many times, how many times have you tried to tell people about the truth and they didn't want to hear it, but instead they would rather hear the voice of a stranger and it's a dangerous thing. We have to be careful. You can't just... Connect yourself to anything that's on TV. You can't just connect yourself to any preacher that's out there because there's a lot of people out there that are preaching a message that elevates themselves instead of elevates what Jesus has come to do. The enemy tried to deceive Jesus even and tried to offer him a crown before the cross, but Jesus knew that he had to go to the cross before he could ever have the crown. The flock that belongs to a specific shepherd knows his voice, and they will not listen to the voice of a stranger. You know, that's, uh, this is point number four, and I'm closing with point number four. Freedom is different than what I expect. That's what I put right here, and it's really more of a personal message for me, but we can look at verses 9 through 11 and read those verses. Where it says in verses 9 through 11, it says, I am the door. By me, if any man enters in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Next verse. The thief comes not but for to steal, kill, and to kill, and to destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it, that they might have it more abundantly. Verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life. For the sheep. I, I, I titled this number four. What I said was freedom is different than what I expected. See in the first analogy. Jesus is the shepherd. And he comes in and he has his voice. And he's speaking the truth. That he came preaching. Before Jesus went to the cross. That's what he did. He came preaching. When you get into the book of Matthew. And the Beatitudes. When Jesus is on the mount. Of, and, he's, and he's preaching. What is he doing? He's preaching the kingdom to the people. He said, the meek shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those 
that 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 are that mourn. You understand? What I mean? He's saying something opposite of what people would expect. Blessed are those that mourn. What are you talking about? The meat shall inherit the earth. That's not what the world said. The world said, stomp on their neck as I'm climbing up the ladder. <laughs> Jesus came lowly and riding on a donkey. Jesus was born a baby in a manger. Everything's different. Freedom looks different than what I expected. Jesus came in preaching the message of the kingdom. Then he says, I am the good shepherd and I laid down my life for the sheep. He said that the door will be opened unto them and they will be able to go out and they will be able to find freedom. They will find pasture. That's what the idea is there. Freedom. they got a worship service going on. Freedom to be able to find pasture. To be, able to, to be able to find the nourishment that they need. You understand? To, they, be, they can come out. They can come back in. You understand the idea behind that? There's security behind that. Jesus said, I laid down my life for the sheep. Jesus' offering was sacrificial. The, the thieves and the robbers, on the other hand, they elevate themselves. You, you get it? Because he goes on to say about a hireling. He says, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, but the hireling flees. See, whenever a person is a hireling, he sees a wolf coming. He doesn't want to take, take it on the chin with the wolf. He instead flees. Unfortunately, we still see the same thing today in the church. There's men that want to elevate themselves. I'm here to tell you something, and this goes for preachers and it goes for people in the pew. The same. When the true gospel reaches into your heart and your life, what ends up happening is, is that self comes down a notch. That's the gospel right there. Amen. Jesus said, I'm sorry, John the Baptist said, I must decrease so that he can increase. And if you remember the story, John had this ministry that was just blowing up, dude. Everybody was coming to be baptized by John the Baptist. Then all of a sudden, Jesus starts preaching and everybody's flocking to Jesus. John, John's disciples come to him and said, everybody's going to him. John the Baptist's response was, I'm not him. I came to prepare the way for him. I must decrease so that he might increase. Guess what? You and I, when the true gospel hits our life, we decrease so that others might increase. The book of Ephesians says, prefer your brother greater than yourself. If we're always trying to be right, if we're always trying to get the upper hand on everybody, then guess what? We're, start, we're trying to elevate ourselves instead of letting the Lord be elevated through our actions in our lives. Amen? I can tell you a lot of times, listen to me, I've had conversations with people in here, and you probably know who I'm talking about if it came out, but we, we, we just keep it between ourselves. There's been people in here that I've had conversations with that people spoke to them improperly. And then and, and they were just on the phone and they're like, dude, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't let nobody talk to me like that. I'm about to tell somebody just like it is. He said, but you know what? At the same time, I feel something different in me. I feel like God's trying to do something in me to teach me that I don't have to respond the way that I used to respond. It's God doing it because if you leave it to me, I'm about to tell you about yourself. If you leave it to me, I might do more than just tell you. It might go down. But yet at the same time, I must decrease so that he might increase. 